Can't be a bit of ABBA. This is lesson four in your Elsham High Citizenship course and it is all about money. So in your workbook at the top there are two boxes. One asks you to define money and the other one asks you to define something called fiat money which we'll look at in a minute. But first let's look at what money is. Well money is a medium of exchange. It allows people to obtain what they need to live. Above all, money is a unit of account. It's a socially accepted standard unit with which things are priced. So in your little box, if you write down the most important phrase there is that money is a medium of exchange and it is a socially accepted standard unit. So what did we do before money? Well, bartering was one way that people exchanged goods for other goods before money was created as a medium for exchange. Commodity money was used in the 17th and 18th century, so we exchanged commodities, which is basically raw materials. So we might have exchanged animal skins, um, corn, coffee, and so on. So let's look at fiat money. Um, I didn't know what this was before I did this unit of work. But if you think about it, like gold and other precious metals, money has worth because for most people, it represents something valuable. But physically, money itself, the actual coins and notes, is not really worth anything. So this is where we come across something called fiat money, which is what we have in the UK, you have it in America. And basically, fiat money is a form of currency that is declared legal tender. So it's the, the money that we use. But the term fiat is derived from the Latin, which means decided by authority. So what that means is that the value of fiat money is not determined by the material with which it is made. That means the metals used to mint coins and the paper used for bills and notes are not valuable themselves. Rather, the value of the money is determined by the government and it retains its value through government stability and that of the nation's economy. So this is quite an interesting thing to get your head around. The money in your pocket is physically not worth anything. It's just paper and metal. But by way of the authority who has decided that this green one is worth five and this brown one is worth 10 and the purple one is worth 20, it's been decided that that paper is meaningful in terms of it represents a specific amount decided by authority. Up until 1970, you could around the world trade in your money for gold. So you could kind of transfer, if you like, what you had um, and swap it for gold. But you can't do that anymore, not since 1970. So you're carrying around money that is only worth something because somebody has decided that it is. So what is the economy? Well, the word economy literally translates as household management because it's based on ecos, which means house, and namin, which means manage. So ecos namin economy, household management. And what the economy is, it's the state of a country or region in terms of the production and consumption of goods and services and the supply of money. So we produce things, we make them and we consume them. We buy them, we eat them, we use them. Um, goods and services. So the economy is the state of that balance. Let's have a look at what that means in a bit more detail. So there's a box on your worksheet that asks you to identify what your role is in the economy. So how do you affect the economy? Well, the answer is we all shape it through our life choices. So you are contributing to the economy every time you buy something or every time you go to work. And it also has an impact on the economy if you choose to spend or work less. So what everyone does with their money can determine, can change how the economy is doing. So you can see there on the right, there's a little diagram that shows if you look at the top, you have um, on the right firms, so organizations, companies providing goods and services. They're making goods and creating services 
and also they are providing wages, salaries, benefits, and they are all going into households. So households are buying goods and services with the wages, salaries and benefits that come in from where they work. Then on the bottom, households then give labour services. So they work for the firms, the organisations and companies, and then they pay for those goods and services. So it's kind of like a cycle. Things are made, things are bought, things are made, things are bought. But the balance is really important because the amount coming into your household will obviously shape how much you buy from what's coming out of firms. So the economy is a very uh, delicately balanced situation, as we will see shortly. So the next box um, in your workbook asks you to identify how you can tell if the economy is doing well or if the economy is doing badly. So there are four things that you can look at to give you an idea of how the economy is doing. So the first thing is what you call GDP, and that stands for gross domestic product. The GDP is the economic growth. And what it is, it's a measure of all of the goods and services produced in a country over a period of time, for example, a year. An increase in that means generally that the economy is growing. So if you've got more people making things, more companies making things, you've got more services going out there, that is a sign of economic growth. The second thing that gives you an idea of how an economy is doing is inflation. And inflation is all about the price at which prices in shops rise. So if you imagine inflating a balloon, inflation um, is supposed to be kept um, at a certain level so that we can be sure that things don't get too expensive. So the government historically has considered anything above or below 2% undesirable. So 2% of, of increase in a price is undesirable. Um, the third thing that shows you how an economy is doing is the level of unemployment. So this is how many people want to work but can't find a job. For the economy, the fewer of those there are, the better. So unemployment is another good measure of how an economy is doing. And then finally, inequality, how a country's wealth and prosperity is distributed. So economists tend to see high inequality as a sign of an unhealthy economy. So in other words, if a certain amount of people in a country have a lot of wealth and a certain amount of people have very little, that's a sign of an unhealthy economy. There isn't the right balance of money going into the right areas potentially. So the Bank of England, what is the Bank of England and what influence does it have over our economy? So remember, the economy is the state of the balance between production and consumption and the supply of money. So what does the bank do to control our economy? First thing you need to know is that the bank is owned by the UK government. The capital of the bank is held by the Treasury Solicitor on behalf of Her Majesty's, His Majesty's Treasury. Um, what the bank do is they keep an eye on threats to the economy and they keep inflation at around 2%. So that's the target that was set by the government. So that's the aim of the Bank of England. There are over 4.5 billion Bank of England notes in circulation. Together, they are worth about 80 billion pounds. 4% of money is held physically in the form of cash, so bank notes and coins. So if you think about that, that tells you the amount of money that is in circulation. If only 4% of it is held physically, the rest of it is just the numbers. There are no physical notes to represent that amount of money. So those of you that have been paying attention to the news over the last six months or so will know that inflation is no longer in or around the level of the 2% that the Bank of England has as its target and that the government would ideally want it to be. As of October 2022, the rate of inflation stands at 11.1%. So what that means is, whereas before 
if you'd have bought something that cost a pound, it will now cost one pound 11 P. So the rate of inflation should be around 2%. It's currently at 11.1. So lots of people are asking the question, why is inflation so high? When we've managed to keep it at around 2%, for the last 20 years, why is inflation now at 11.1%? Well, the main reason for that is an imbalance. There's a lack of balance in supply and demand. So if you remember that circular diagram earlier, there's an imbalance between what's being supplied and what's, what's being demanded. After the pandemic, there was a surge in demand for goods and labor and that outpaced supply. Um, the reason for that, one of the reasons, was the COVID-related bottlenecks, slowed delivery times and infection fears kept workers on the sidelines. So people were wanting goods, services, but companies weren't able to supply in time. In turn, though, prices and wages skyrocketed, which prompted sky high inflation and price increases have affected countries across the globe. Um, some of which have suffered much worse inflation than the UK. In Argentina, for example, inflation stands at 64% and in Turkey, it's nearly 80%. We um, in England and in the UK have noticed in particular gas prices and electricity prices. Energy prices have gone up hugely um, over the last year. Gas prices have gone up by around 96% and electricity prices by 54%. So those are two of those services that people are demanding. Um, but the demand is outpaced by, sorry, the demand is too much for the people who are supplying it. They don't have the stores and resources needed to suppliers. As a result, the prices go up. So how do the Bank of England control price rises? When you've got huge inflation, prices are going up. What can the Bank of England do to help that? Well, one thing they can do is influence interest rates. So they can try and control prices by influencing interest rates. We'll have a look what they are in a second. But interest rates have an impact on how much spending there is in the economy and how that feeds through to prices in the shops. Um, and the Bank of England sets the UK's main interest rate, so the bank rate. So let's have a look at what an interest rate is. An interest rate tells you how high the cost of borrowing is or how high the rewards are for saving. So if you're a borrower, if you need to um, borrow some money, the interest rate is the amount you are charged for borrowing it, shown as a percentage of the total amount of the loan. If you are a saver, if you're saving money, the savings rate tells you how much money will be paid into your account as a percentage of your savings. Even a small change in interest rates can have a big impact. And it's important to keep an eye on whether they rise, fall or stay the same. So if interest rates rise, borrowing could become more expensive for you. So if you imagine you have a mortgage for £130,000, so the mortgage is the loan that you get in order to buy a house. It's a huge loan and you pay it off over a period of time. So imagine you're paying off this £130,000 mortgage over 25 years, because that's about the amount of time you pay it off in. If the interest rate on the mortgage is 2.5%, then the monthly repayment will be £583. But if the interest rate is 1% higher, so if it just goes up to 3.5, suddenly the monthly repayment will be higher too and it will be £651. So you've got to find 70-ish pounds more a month to pay your mortgage. So it's very important as you get older that you understand how a change in interest rates can impact your ability to pay when borrowing money. Final few questions for you here and as a recap and then at the bottom of your workbook, you've also got a little bit of maths that you can have a go at. So you're going to look at the amount borrowed in the first place and have a look if you can figure out what the repayment will be um, in total if the interest rate is 2%, if it's 3% or if it's 5%. So have a look at what happens if you borrow £500 and if you borrow £130,000. And then there's some questions up here 
that you can talk about in your group. Thank you very much. See you in two weeks.